Today is April the 28th. It's a day that I remember very well. My family does. Today is the day, uh, 24 years ago, that uh, while I was speaking at a conference in Boston, Massachusetts, to a group of youth workers from all over New England, I got a phone call right after the lunch break from my sister here in Atlanta, letting me know that my dad had just passed away. My dad died of a heart attack around midday. On that day, it was a Friday, April the 28th, 1995, 24 years ago. I was 36 years old, and now I had joined the ranks of the fatherless. Uh, my life had really shifted, and my sisters, my family, Shelley's, and my lives had shifted even earlier when I was 29 years old. I kind of technically lost my dad to disease. My dad became disabled with a very rare and uh, brain virus that left him almost overnight disabled mentally, emotionally, physically. And so I would lost my normal relationship with my dad at 29, but now seven years later, because of a heart attack, my dad was gone. And I think that a lot of us today are in that zone that we, we've either lost our father like, like I had to death or maybe to some other disease. Some of you are at that stage of life where your father's still alive, but things just aren't the way they were and may never will be. Or maybe you've lost your dad to something else. Maybe dysfunction took your dad out of the picture or divorce took your dad out of the picture. Maybe disinterest took your dad out of the picture. And for the next few weeks, I want to believe with you that God is going to do something supernatural and powerful in our house, and that God is going to change the story of what has been called the fatherless generation into a generation of people who know and live like the loved sons and loved daughters of a perfect heavenly father. Because one thing that we all have in common today, every one of us in this gathering, both at North Atlanta High School and here at 515, every single one of us longs to have our Father's blessing in our lives. It is hardwired from the beginning. It is innate in every single one of us. We want our Father's blessing. You see it when we're tiny little kids. And I don't know what the scenario was for you, but for me, when my dad would show up at the swimming pool in the apartment complex that we grew up in on a summer day, maybe he'd gone out golfing in the morning, but he'd come home in the afternoon, and it was rare for dad to make an appearance at a, at a swimming pool situation. And when he would show up, everything changed. It was like, oh my goodness, my dad is here. And you see it with kids when their dad shows up at the piano recital or the soccer game or at the baseball field or wherever it is. And moms, it's no knock on you. We all owe our very existence to you. You have nurtured us and cared for us and clothed us and fed us and taken care of us in the minutia of life. So I hope you don't get your feelings hurt. And I, and I think you actually love it uh, even more when dad shows up and is like, mom wasn't even there the whole time. It's like, yay, daddy's here. Daddy's home. Daddy made it. And the mom's like, oh, rolling my eyes one more time. Who do you think carried all the furniture to the pool? Who do you think brought the snacks to the pool? Who do you think got all the floaties to the pool and got everybody's bathing suits washed again? Who do you think is running this operation? But now daddy is home and everything is going to go up a notch or two. And when dad arrives, what did we do? We'd say, daddy, daddy, watch me. Have you heard that one before? Watch me, daddy. Watch me. I'm about to do my best jump, my best dive. I learned how to do the pickle. I learned how to do a cannonball. I learned how to do a backflip. I learned how to run from the side. Dad, watch, watch, watch. And if dad is like, you know, you know, far be it from dad to need to say hello to mom or get something to eat. No, watch me. And then, are you watching? Are you watching? Are you, Dad, are you watching? Are you watching? And now once the child is convinced that Dad is fully engaged in watching, now I will do my four-step run from the side and hold my nose cannonball into the pool, only to come up 
Doesn't matter that I didn't drown. Doesn't matter about the quality of the jump. The only thing that matters when I come out of the water is what? Did you see it? Did you see it, Daddy? And Dad, bless his heart, for the 10,000th time, is like, I saw it, baby girl. I saw it, baby girl. That was amazing, sweetheart. Way to go, Ace. That's what my dad called me at that age. Good job. You're getting so much better. You're running so much faster. You sang great. You acted great. You played great. Whatever it was, we just needed to know our dad saw it. He loved it. He was pleased with it, and he was pleased with us. And this is the innate, God-woven desire that is in every single one of us to have our Father's blessing. And by that, I mean our Father's approval, our Father's affection, our Father's participation in our life. To know beyond a shadow of our doubt, my dad believes in me. And when you get it, praise God for it. Some of you have got the best dads on the planet. And right now you're smiling on the inside. You're remembering all those moments and you built on them year after year. If that's your dad and he was a great dad, an encouraging dad, a present dad, an affirming dad, an affectionate dad, text him right now in the middle of the talk. You have permission. Text your dad if he is alive and say, dad, I just want to say all over again. It's not even Mother's Day or Father's Day yet, but I love you. Your tie's coming in a couple of weeks and you are are a stud. I am who I am because of you. Because when we get that blessing, when we get that approval, the affection, I had a friend of mine tell me the other day, grown person, doing life, I've never heard my father say the words, I love you. But when you get the I love you's, you know, the real ones, like the words, not the, you know, I mean it, I don't need to say it ones. And when you get the approval and you get the participation, when your life is overshadowed by that idea, my dad believes in me, then that's a foundational stone. And a child, a boy or a girl, a young man or a young woman can stand on that foundational stone and begin to build their lives. It's not a guarantee that life is going to be flawless, but it is an essential component to life moving forward well. And when the blessing isn't there, when the approval is not there, the affection is not there, the participation is there, whether it is death or divorce or disinterest or busyness or dysfunction on your father's part, or maybe not only was there not a blessing, there was actually a curse. There was, I don't believe in you. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never be anything significant in your life. I wish you were never born. Or worse, there's hurt coming your way from your father into your life. When that's the case and the blessing is absent, there is a gap. And what I've learned in life is you can either fake it or face it. And I'm inviting us in these few weeks together to face the gap, to face what is real in our lives because we can try to bury it a thousand miles below the ground, but it has its way of working right back up to the surface every single day. And over the course of our ministry together, I have heard countless people say to me things like this, I don't care what my father thinks. My dad's opinion doesn't matter to me at all. I don't care if I ever see him again. The last thing I want to do is be like my father. I will never be a workaholic like my dad. I will never treat my kids like my dad treated us. I will never be a substance abuser like my dad. I couldn't give a rip if I ever see him again. And just quietly on the inside, my pastoral heart every single time is going, and why are you telling me this again? Maybe the same reason an atheist says so emphatically, I don't believe in God. I'm like, okay, then why do you even need to say that? I think that faking it and stuffing it and acting like I don't need it and I'll be fine without it 
is not going to get you and I to the place that God wants us to be in our lives, which is transformed no matter what was into what can be. And that's living empowered under the blessing of a perfect heavenly father and knowing deep down in the fiber of our being that we are loved sons and loved daughters. That's who we are. And that's how we're going to live our lives. And this is the power of the gospel. And it's the power that's on the table today. When that gap is there, all manner of things happen in our lives. And it's not just a talk that I'm giving today. People outside the church are the ones who are raising this issue to the surface today. The, the book, The Boy Crisis, is, is taken um, our generation by storm. And if you haven't seen it, you should read it. If you don't like to read, go watch the TED Talks. Um, Jordan Peterson, one of the the leading voices among millennials and Gen Z right now. He's talking about the fatherless generation and talking about what it means to actually grow up into the people God created us to be. So I'm not going to generalize today. I'm not going to make the mistake of acting like a psychiatrist or a psychologist today or saying that I understand your story. But we have to be honest today. A lot of the uncertainty, a lot of the lack of confidence A lot of the lack of self-identity and self-worth, a lot of the aimlessness and a lot of the anger, a lot of the relational conflict that we're dealing with in our lives right now, and a lot of the emotional instability right now in our generation can be tied back to the gap of not having my dad, my earthly father, say, I love you. I am proud of you. I am here for you. I believe in you. And I'm not perfect, but I'm going to show you the ropes the best I know how. I'm going to provide a safety net under you so that you know you can soar in life. And if it doesn't work out, guess what? We're just going to start all over again because you've got incredible potential. You are a somebody. I couldn't be happier that you're on this planet. And I just want to stand by and applaud and cheer and give parameters and and guidance as you become everything that God has created you to be. And without that, the gap is real. And I'm telling you people, it is real. Right now in America, one in four children are living in a home where no father is present. And of the other three children where there is a father present, not all of those situations are great. And so if that is the reality, and if we are reaping the harvest of no-fault divorce, and I don't say that to make anybody journeying through divorce feel anything more than you probably already have felt in the frustration of walking through your own life. But as a nation, we were determined that we were going to make divorce as easy as possible. And so no longer was there a judge and a court and a cause and contention. Now, as of a decade ago, New York brought us to the point where every one of the 50 states has a no-fault divorce law, meaning no one's at fault, a couple of hundred bucks, a couple of days, and this is done. And now this is America. But guess what, America? We're now reaping the harvest of the no-fault divorce. And as it turns out, there's some fallout in that equation. And the fallout that is in the vast majority of those divorces, the person who left the house was the father who had the blessing to give. And so here we sit. What's called the fatherless generation. And we're trying to find our way and make our way. And we've been invited by the church and by the gospel into a relationship with God who wants us to know him as a heavenly father. And I wish I could tell you how many times a young person has said to me these words, if God is like my dad, I'm not interested. And now you see the dilemma. But the good news today is that God is on the move. And through history, God has had fatherhood 
on his radar. You know, when the Old Testament ends, it's pretty amazing. It ends with this little prophet Malachi. Have you ever read Malachi? The very last prophet in the Old Testament, just four chapters. And like all prophets, he's kind of calling us up into what can be in life. He's calling it like it is in life, but he's also promising a hope. But I want you to notice how Malachi ends the Old Testament. So as we read in the order of the books in the Old Testament, the last verse of the Old Testament is Malachi chapter four. So how are we going to end this whole section of life as God started paradise, we messed it all up, he still gathered a people, he made him a promise, he called him to let him lead him, he aimed him toward a promised land, and he said, there's going to be a Messiah coming, and all this is going to change. How does that whole section of our story end? It ends like this in verse five. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day that the Lord comes. So every prophet's going to tell you that life isn't just going to free fall into some ending that we choose. There is a coming day of the Lord. And he reminds us that that's going to happen again. But he said, something is going to happen. It's potentially possible for you before that day comes. And listen to what he says. He, this one who comes in the spirit of the prophet Elijah, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and curse the land or strike the land with a curse. And so what Malachi is saying is before the coming day of the Lord, the people of God need to come back to the faith of their fathers. So that's A. But in this also is the context, the relationship that we're going to see next week of God wanting to actually, in the process of restoring us to our relationship with God, of restoring us to our relationship with our fathers and our fathers in their relationship to us. And so interestingly, when you just turn this 400 year page of history to the New Testament and you turn over to Luke's gospel, look how Luke opens his story. He's telling about the birth of John the Baptist, who's going to prepare the way for Jesus Christ, the son of God. And this is what he says about John the Baptist. We find this in Luke chapter one, and we're reading up to verse 17. And he, talking about John the Baptist, this is the prophecy that's coming over his life. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. So we heard about the spirit of Elijah, and now we're seeing that this same spirit of Elijah, this miracle-working, supernatural, transforming spirit of God is what this spirit of Elijah is all about the spirit of Elijah is going to now be on John the Baptist as he prepares the way for the Lord. So it says he will go in the power of the spirit. And look what it says is going to be possible to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And yes, big context to turn the disobedient to the righteous, but to restore a relationship between God as father and his people, and in that to see the possibility of restoring relationships between earthly fathers and their children. And this is the possibility for you and the possibility for me. None of us are going to have to live with our story as it is right now. God isn't going to leave you in the state that you are in with the collateral that happened to you because of your relationship with your earthly father. No, Jesus is coming and is now here and he is going to move you forward and transform your life into the fullness of what he planned for your life. He's going to break every curse restore everything that's been stolen. And that includes things that were stolen from you because of your relationship with your earthly dad. Everybody in this building has the potential to live under the blessing of a perfect father, approved, loved, his participation, his belief in you. We see this promise in Psalm 27, and I love the way that the psalmist phrases it because he puts us in a worst case situation. Look the way, at the way he writes it, Psalm 27, verse 10. 
He says, even if, or though, the translation I'm reading, my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Though my father and mother, there's our word, forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Another translation says, even if my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. In other words, I will not have written over my life abandoned, whether it was death or disease or dysfunction or divorce or disinterest. I will not have the story abandoned written over my life because there's someone else in the equation and he's going to take me up as his own son, as his own daughter, and he's going to let me know that there is the possibility of me living with his blessing in my life. I cannot turn the calendar back to April 28, 1995. I can't undo that. But I can walk in the blessing of a perfect heavenly father today, and I can experience what that means in my life and live that out of my life. And I know this is true because of the power of the gospel. You're like, well, what does the gospel have to do with me and my dad? Well, I want you to notice in Matthew chapter 27, what happened when Jesus died? I know we've already come through Good Friday, we've already come, e- come through Easter, we've already talked about all that, but I want you to see something powerful that happened in the moment that Jesus died. And we find this in Matthew 27, reading up to verse 45. It says, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, that's from noon until 3 p.m., darkness came over all the land. Now, this is a picture of what creation did in the moment that Jesus died. Creation actually shrouded the cross in darkness because it was too horrific for anyone to comprehend. But but there's a parallel there because maybe some of you, because of what you've walked through in life, a darkness has shrouded your life. And maybe you're living life and doing the thing and you've got friends and you're trying to make progress, but there's still this, this dark cloud over your life. And maybe that is connected to what's going on or what did go on between you and your earthly father. But look what happens in the darkness. In the midst of it all, verse 46, about the ninth hour or about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Now this is the language of Jesus' day. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which translates, fortunately, we have the English into my God, my God, why, there's our question today, have you forsaken me? The very next thing Jesus is going to say is, to tell us die. It is finished, and then he's going to die. But right before he finishes the work of paying for our sin, he experiences something he's never experienced before. He experiences being separated from his father. Something that from eternity past and through the 33 years he's been on earth, he has never known. And when he realizes that this is a part of getting in our place on the cross, this is part of The penalty of sin is spiritual death, and spiritual death is separation from God. It's not just pain and physical death. It's a physical and spiritual process. And when he now is realizing, my father is walking out on me. Forsaken means to be left behind specifically in one of the most vulnerable times of your life. That moment where I needed you, man. I needed you to be there. I needed you to show up. I needed you to sober up. I needed you. And in this moment where Jesus more than ever has needed God, he doesn't say, my father, my father. Now he's in our place. He, he's, uh, he's letting us see the gap between sinfulness and holiness. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In other words, why are you turning your back on me? Why are you walking away 
from me. And we know the answer. It is because Jesus, the scripture says, became sin on our behalf. He didn't just step in for a moment like a a fill-in on the cross. He became our sin on the cross. And he bore the penalty of our sin on the cross, which means he experienced what we should have experienced, which is God not being able to have fellowship with us. That's why God forsook Jesus on the cross, because Jesus was your sin on the cross. And the wages of sin is death. But I think another reason why God forsook Jesus on the cross is so that you could know because Jesus was forsaken on the cross, God will never forsake those who put their faith in him. And this is why the scripture says in Hebrews, your God who has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You're like, well, how can I know, God, that you won't leave me or forsake me? Because I left my son for you. And I forsook my son for you. And that's how you can know I will never leave you or forsake you. And we all have circumstances and situations and days and seasons where we say, well, you know, I don't know if God was there or where was God in this situation or where was God in that situation. But then we come around and and we see clearly and we see differently and we survive and we make it through that season. And then we look back and go, oh, God was with me all the time. That's how I actually made it through that season was that God didn't leave me in that season. And the circumstance was crazy, but God never left me in that moment. And even though you and I are not going to live perfect lives in Christ, our account has been changed. And we know that our father has called us sons and daughters born all over again by spiritual life. And he is never going to leave his own behind. And we have got the cross in the middle of our story now changing our story. And I don't know if you're buying in yet. Some of you may be still faking it even up to now and saying, this is all well and good. I hope my roommate hears this. I hope my cousin hears this. I have a coworker who needs this. I've got a friend that I work out with and he definitely needs to hear this. But I just want you to know that you can't shake what's woven into you at birth. I read a study by Peggy Drexler, a doctor in psychology today, and she was stunned She says in the article, she was surprised. She studied 75 highly successful women at the season of life where they had great families, great careers, great lives. And she said, I was surprised to find how strong the connection was for all of them, that no matter how successful they were, how well their families were doing, they all were still evaluating their success through the lens of their father's approval. And she said some of them who had actually had bad relationships, injurious relationships with their fathers, still held their father's approval in a surprisingly high place in their lives. And the same can be said about a CEO, a Wall Street guy, a guy who's killing it out in the world, and maybe who has a really good family, but somehow he's either fighting against a dad who said you'll never make it to prove him wrong, or he's living a little bit off kilter because his dad just never could step up and say, you are doing an amazing job. And I just want you to know, I believe in you. I remember when I was 18 years old, God called me to preach. I didn't see it coming. And I've shared it in our house a few different times. But I I was going down one path as a freshman at Georgia State University, and all of a sudden, literally out of the blue, that path closes down, and now I don't know what I'm going to do with my life because I'm not going to be a professional tennis player anymore. Um, You can laugh. It's okay. Um, People are like, should we laugh at that, or should we just say, oh, that's good that you believe that? And 
all of a sudden in the gap of not knowing now what I'm going to do, the Lord comes into that space like he often does in our lives. He closes one door, he opens another. It's not just a saying, it's real life. And when he came through the door, he said, you're going to be a preacher for your generation. And I was like, okay, didn't see that coming. Basically at 18 years of age in Smyrna, Georgia, he said to me, I'm going to be doing what I'm doing right now. So he was right. (laughs) So I went to my pastor and I said, I think God's calling me to preach. That's the words we used back then. And he said, great, here's a few things I want you to do for the next two weeks. And I want you to come back and talk to me. And so I did what he asked me to do, came back in two weeks and said, man, I'm more convinced than ever God wants me to preach. And he said, great, I want you to come down next Sunday night after the Sunday night service. And we're going to tell the church that the Lord's called you to preach. And that's just what you did back then. If you grew up in one of those churches, you understand. If not, I don't have time to explain it. And so that's what was going to happen. And so I left that Sunday thinking I've got a week now to let my dad know what's all going to go down on Sunday. Now, my dad was Catholic from a Catholic family, wasn't practicing Catholic. My mom was Southern Baptist, extremely practicing Southern Baptist. So we were a little conflicted family all along. And dad had come some on and off. But now we were in a season where dad had kind of checked out of church. And so this wasn't going to be like the normal, hey, dad, I'm going to go down and da-da-da, and you'll be happy, and you'll pray for me, and we'll go out afterwards, and you'll speak a blessing over me. I just had to get dad to church that Sunday night. So I put it off Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, went to church Sunday morning, and now it's Sunday afternoon. Anybody been there with me? Hello? And now it's about three o'clock, and I'm in my bedroom, and I'm like, we're leaving in 45 minutes for church, and dad hasn't gotten invited yet. So I come out of my room, go in the kitchen in our little apartment in Smyrna. My dad's standing at the stove. I can see it as clearly as I can see you right now. And he's eating leftovers out of the pot on the kitchen stove, as my dad would at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday. And I come and stand next to him and I just, I flub. I'm just like, I can't get a word out. I don't even know where to start. I don't know how to begin this conversation. And we have, my dad and I have no common ground around Jesus. And so I say, dad, um, the Lord has called me to preach, to be a preacher. I really feel like that's happened in the last few weeks. And whew, that was a hard one. And I said, and I'm going to tell the church tonight, and I would really love for you to come. And what happened, what was transferred verbally was just uh, the words, that's great, Ace. End of conversation. But the look on my dad's face was, was different. And this is no fault to my dad, by the way. My dad was a really great dad. But the look on his face was like, wow, my son is going to be a Baptist preacher. And I could just see the wheels turning. My dad had a a once a month Friday card game, poker. (laughs) And I could just see it. I knew who his golf buddies were. I knew who his few buddies were. I could see it in my mind and he could see it in his mind. Yeah, I just found out. This is one of his uh, friend's sons about this time. Just got into scholarship to play football at Auburn. I mean, hello, couldn't have been a better outcome for a young man than that. I'm looking at me and I'm, you know, all of about 96 pounds and not even good enough to play tennis. Another kid's going to be a lawyer. Another kid's going to take over his dad's business. I mean, these are the stories I'm hearing my dad say on and off. And then I can just see it coming around to my dad. There they all are at the card game. And it's like, and Lou, what'd you say your kid's doing again? Going to Georgia State. And what's he going to do? He's going to be a a Baptist preacher. (laughs) Deal me in. (laughs) All that happened in a nanosecond with no words. And that night I did say to our church family, I feel like I know the Lord has called me to preach and I'm saying yes to that, whatever that means for my life. And yes, there was an empty seat there where my dad should have been. 
And I left that church that night and went on the path that has led me to here. And my dad and I didn't talk about it that night. We didn't talk about it that week. He didn't ask me how did it go at church Sunday night. I'm sorry I didn't come. Here's why I didn't come. I felt conflicted because of blah, blah, blah. And you know, I'm really not sure where I am with church and where I am with God. And I don't feel that, that, that's my place sometimes. I feel like everybody's judging me when I'm there. And I have all this history and baggage that you don't know about yet because uh, you're still 19 and I haven't really told you all about the stuff that I've been carrying your whole life so far. And so I was gonna come, but then at the last minute, I think the enemy just got in there and like sidetracked me and made me doubt, made me didn't believe. And so I'm really sorry. I, not, there's none of that. You're just, I wasn't there, and it's not talked about that week, that month, that year, or the next year, or the next year, or the next year, or the next year when I graduate and go to seminary to be trained to be a pastor. It's just not talked about. And the gap is real. Now, fortunately, I'm alive to the fact that I have a heavenly father. I'm alive to the fact that I'm a loved son. I'm alive to the fact that the cross changes everything. I'm alive to the fact that God is doing something in my life that is powerful and miraculous, but the gap is there. And maybe the gap is there for you. And so a few takeaways for tonight, and then we have a few weeks to open this up and unpack it together, a few weeks to face it and not fake it. And here are a few takeaways I hope for all of us today. Number one, I hope that you'll see today, maybe for the first time, that the gospel story of Jesus is not simply about just getting you to heaven. It's really about getting you to a heavenly father. That's what the gospel is all about. And some of you got the heaven part. You just didn't get the heavenly father part. And it's because of the gap. But God wants to close that gap. The second takeaway is I want you to understand, and I want us all to get honest about this, that some of our earthly relationships might not get fixed. Somebody's got to say amen to that. This is not going to be a little spiritual saying over all the hurt and the pain and the disappointment that you've lived through. We're going to be honest that all of the earthly relationships might not get fixed on earth, but you can get fixed by the power of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. You can change. Even if the relationship can't change, God can change you. And do not let the enemy sell you today that this is going to be your story. This is going to be your life. This is going to be how you live. This is not the end of your story. God is not through working in your life. God has got power to overcome whatever the enemy has brought into your life. And he is going to do that in the power of Jesus' name. You know, my dad, uh, so I'm 29 when my dad has this viral infection, goes into a coma, ends up having a serious brain surgery and is different for the rest of his life. All of our lives change in an instant. Second brain surgery, a few years later, I'm probably 33 years old. I'm sitting back at Piedmont Hospital in my dad's room, just the two of us, and I'm doing my best to give my dad what I think he needs most, which is a father's blessing. And I'm not his father, but his dad's been out of the picture since the day I was born. He never talked about his dad. He never talked about his granddad. He never talked about anything about that. And I've heard some stories, but I don't know the whole thing. And I'm just sitting there with my dad and I'm just trying to pour blessing on my dad. And I'm telling him this day, because I don't know, we've almost lost him so many different times in this journey. And I say, dad, Jesus loves you. Dad, I just want you to know one more time, God cares about you. I want you to know one more time, God paid the very highest price for you, dad. And faith in Jesus changes everything. Faith in Jesus turns stories around, dad. It's changed my life and it can change your life. And my dad, laying there, head all wrapped from having this second surgery to remove some infection in his brain. And he looks straight down the hospital bed at me. And he says, nobody ever loved me, son. And nobody ever wanted me. And I don't believe God loves me either. And I could hardly breathe. And I realize 
that's not just my father in that hospital bed. That's somebody's son in that hospital bed. And he never got the approval. And he never got the affection. And he never got the participation. And he didn't get to stand on the foundation stone that said, my dad believes in me. And I'm not trying to excuse anything your dad has done. I'm just telling you, your dad is also a son. And fixing things isn't easy. But God can transform you. And I sat at the end of that bed and I thought, oh my gosh, if my dad didn't get disabled, if he wasn't talking like an 89 year old instead of a 62 year old right now, if he wasn't being unfiltered and unguarded like he has been his whole life because of this brain situation, I would never know how he has dealt with life his whole life. And I thought, man, You've been a good dad given all what you've been carrying. And now I'm going to get to do what your dad didn't do. I'm not your dad, but I'm going to tell you until the day you leave this earth that you are loved, that you are prized, that you are brilliant, that you're a genius, that you are awesome, that I am proud of you, that I believe in you, that I love you, that I care about you. I'm going to just keep giving you what I've got. Because God's changing me. Oh, there's still some work's got to be done to you know, deal with all this. And some of you are like, you don't even know, Louis. I'm so sorry that you had to have a misunderstanding with your dad at the kitchen stove. That must have just really broke your heart. You know, like my dad wasn't even at the kitchen stove. My dad wasn't even sober enough to talk to. My dad would have knocked me across the kitchen if I told him. I just want you to know, third takeaway. I don't know what's happened with your earthly dad. But there is a cross standing in the middle of this message today. And you know what it's telling you? God is not moving on without you. Because if he wanted to, he already would have. But he nailed his son on a tree so that you would know he's not moving on without you. And maybe today's just step one of saying, I'm going to face it. I tried to bury it for 46 years and it is as much at the surface today as it ever has been. I remind everyone around me, I never even knew my dad and I don't care. I never even knew my dad and I don't care. I don't even know my dad and I don't care. I didn't even know my, I don't even talk to my dad and I don't care. My dad doesn't matter to me. My dad's not important to me. I don't care if I ever see my dad again. And all we are doing is telling the world that there is a gap. But God is in the gap with you today. Can I close and tell you something really fast? So my dad gets disabled, probably fast forward now from 1819 when we were at the kitchen stove to, um, I don't know, maybe I'm around 30, 31 years old now. And Charles Stanley, the pastor I went down the aisle to who told the church that I had been called to preach, asked me to come and preach at First Baptist Church Atlanta. 31 year old kid, I was so scared and so excited. I had believed one day I would stand in that pulpit in that great church and preach the gospel. And this was going to be the day. It was Father's Day. And I preached a message similar to the ones that I'm going to be sharing in the next few weeks at our house sitting about nine rows back was my mom on the end of the pew right under the balcony overhang and sitting right next to her in his wheelchair looking like a million bucks was my dad and my dad had never heard me speak and hadn't been an occasion Shelly and I had been living in Texas the whole time of his disability coming back and forth to Atlanta we had a fledgling campus ministry in Texas but My dad just heard about it. And there was my dad looking great. You would want my mom as a caregiver, by the way. He looked fantastic, all decked out, sitting there with this wheelchair. 
I'm now freaking out because I'm preaching for Charles Stanley at First Baptist Church on Father's Day. And my father is there for the very first time to ever see me do the thing that I told him that God had called me to do at the kitchen stove. So I never look over there. I mean, the whole message, I just like, I'm looking over here and over there and up there, but I'm not looking over there because I don't know what's going on over there. And finally the message ends and I kind of like live through it, praise God. And I come down and everybody's coming to be nice to me. Oh, you did such a good job. Oh, that was so wonderful. We're so glad to have you back in Atlanta this weekend. Oh, that must be Shelly. She's lovely, blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah. Eventually all the people faded away, but there were more people around my mom because my mom was a saint of the church, but yet she'd been absent for all these years. She was caring for my dad. And so all the people around my mom, they're all loving on my mom and talking to my mom. And so I had to wait till mom's crowd dies down. And once mom's crowd dies down, I kind of make my way over there. And I don't, I'm not sure what to think, feel, say again. You're like, Louie, you're a pretty good talker. I say, yeah, I get in real life like you guys. I'm just like you. Um, it's hard to figure out what to say in real life. Life, right? So I walk up to my dad and I don't have any idea what to say. And I walk up there and he looks up at me. I wish you could knew my dad. He had these piercing blue eyes and this little, this grin that just would turn the world upside down. And he looked up at me and I got that grin and I said, I could hardly get the words out. As soon as I opened my mouth, I just broke. And I said, dad, thank you so much for coming. And my dad, he just reached up his hand to me because he couldn't stand up. And he just reached up his hand to me and he grabbed my hand and he said, are you kidding me, Ace? He said, that was the best thing I've ever heard in my life. And you know the best part of it? I knew it wasn't just like, I'm gonna give you a little you know, compliment here because you just did your thing up there and probably you're nervous. No, my dad was, he meant every word of it. It was the best thing he'd ever heard in his life. It was the most amazing thing he'd ever seen his son do. It was him being proud of me doing the thing that God had uniquely wired me to do. And I mean, there are just tears coming down my face. I'm just like, thank you so much. I'm so glad, so glad y'all are here. Okay, let's go. We're gonna have lunch and just trying to get out of the room before I absolutely felt over, but I'm telling you that story so that you'll know for me, I do know about the gaps, but I also know about God restoring things. And I know I'm standing here right now, 24 years after the fact that my dad left this earth. And I know my dad is proud of me. I know he thinks I'm a good communicator. I know he thinks I really am gifted to do the very thing I'm doing right now. And if he was in this room with us right now, he'd be smiling and beaming and going, that's my kid right there. Pretty great, right? That's my son. That's him. Not so great at tennis, but awesome at doing what God has called him to do. And I say that today, not because God can bring your dad back. Maybe that's not possible. Not because he can rewire the divorce. Maybe that's not possible. Not because he can take away the scars that were left on you by your father or the disappointment or the disillusionment or the despair or whatever came your way. But God can turn stories around. And in the midst of whatever, in the midst of whatever, he wants you to know today there is a waterfall that makes Niagara look like your shower when it drips 15 drops after you turn off the water. And that waterfall is coming down from a perfect father in heaven who's loved you the whole time. And he wants you to know today you are chosen and you are seen and you are prized and loved that you have been sought for and searched after and paid for and bought, that you are his loved son, loved daughter of a perfect heavenly father. And it might just be one tiny step today, but would you come towards the God of the cross. And would you believe today that you are something special to him?